Well, let's get right into it. Uh, what I wanted to start with was, first of all, the book is it's so well researched and really wonderfully written. I mean, it is uh, a detail that is unafraid to tackle difficult subjects. Um, uh, but it is clearly written for a broad audience while still maintaining, a, I, well, I'll describe as a degree of academic integrity. So uh, uh, it's really an outstanding piece of work and uh, really informative to anybody who cares about movies or cares about World War II. And as we know, those things uh, often go together. So uh, well done, Christian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Let's start with, you know, whether we're talking about uh, documentaries that uh, Hollywood filmmakers made, uh, propaganda films they made to contribute to the war effort, like Capra's Why We Fight series, or whether we're talking about feature films that uh, uh, sold the American public on the necessity of war and the importance of victory. Uh, really, up until 1939, when the first crack uh, opened up, um, with the film Confessions of a Nazi Spy, there was enormous resistance in the United States to Hollywood doing anything to help a war effort that most of the country wanted no part of. Uh, uh, what was, if you could, take us through the enormity of the challenge faced by those who wanted to contribute through Hollywood uh, to the war effort? There was profound isolationist sentiment across the board throughout the U.S., even after the horror stories came out from Germany, after Kristallnacht, when it became clear about the, the nationwide pogroms against the, the, the Jewish people who lived in Germany, that ultimately resulted in the deaths of six million Jews across Europe. Even at that point, there was still a feeling of, we don't want to get involved in another war. And we just can't afford to suffer what we went through in World War I. Um, so uh, there was that there was that feeling, but then in, within Hollywood, there was actually a business relationship uh, conducted by many of the studios with Nazi Germany. Germany was the largest foreign market for Hollywood films, and so there had been a cozying up there. In fact, uh, the Third Reich even had a charged affairs in uh, Los Angeles named Georg Gisling, who basically the studios would run movie scripts passed to make certain that it did not offend the Nazi German ideas, uh, which is really shocking to consider that even MGM, you know, Louis B. Mayer would be okay with that. And, and, and we're like, well, this is, this is part of, this is the price of doing business. Uh, and, and then the third level is that simply there was a lot of fascist sentiment in the U S at that time, which we don't really talk about that much today, but Jack Warner writes in the 30s about seeing young kids, teenagers, maybe even younger, walking down Hollywood Boulevard wearing swastikas. Uh, in Pacific Palisades, there was actually a fascist compound, this group called the Silver Legion, that basically created this ranch, this sort of fortress, where they decided to hole up until fascism took over the world. Uh, as many know, there was a huge Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden in early 1939. Tens of thousands of American Nazis attended. So the pressure to not confront the Third Reich was really immense. Yeah, and the the production code office, the Hollywood Censorship Board, uh, uh, to simplify what those guys did. Um, uh, I mean, maybe it's not fair to call them, well, certainly they weren't all anti-Semites, but maybe it's not fair to say they were driven by anti-Semitism but they were driven by anti-Semitism <laughs> and uh, they were uh, in large part. I think, I think you are fair to say that. I think that uh, Joseph Breen over time, um, his anti-Semitic views did soften a bit. Uh, actually, Jeremy Arnold has, has a great book about um, the pre-code days um, released by running press and TCM that, that addresses some of that, but there's no question about it. When he came to Hollywood, he was an anti-Semite and, and those, those views were common. In, in Hollywood, uh, among those whose job it was to police the motion picture industry. And four of the five uh, movie studios were, were run by uh, immigrant Jews or descendants, at least, of em immigrant Jews. And, and that informed their way of thinking and this sort of idea that uh, 
Uh, you wouldn't deny that you were Jewish, but uh, I think the phrase was, uh, but you didn't broadcast it. Yeah, there, there was a feeling that if they were to make films that targeted Nazi Germany or that showed what the Third Reich was doing to Jews in Europe, that it could actually make life worse for Jews in Europe. Uh, that was one feeling. Um, and, and then I think there was also just a real sentiment that we are immigrants to this country and we want to assimilate and we don't want to focus too much on our ethnicity, our religion, where we came from. Um, and, and, you know, that, that drive toward assimilation was very powerful at that time. And one of the first films, and a film that we, uh, I think, give too, too much credit for, TCM, for being the first. We don't pay enough attention to Confessions of a Nazi Spy. But uh, uh, MGM's film, The Mortal Storm, from 1940, uh, uh, with uh, Jimmy Stewart, who we'll certainly talk about today, and Margaret Sullivan. Um, that, uh, that made a lot of money. And it was the first uh, uh, movie, you know, again, they didn't ever identify Germany and they, I don't think the specifically Jews were identified, but it came pretty close and it was very obvious even to people not paying attention to uh, what they were talking about. Um, uh, the fact that that movie made a ton of money uh, showed some of these people that uh, there was a, a valid business reason to take on Nazi Germany and take up this cause in the days before America entered the war. That's right, because previously, as you mentioned, Confessions of a Nazi Spy, a film from Warner Brothers, which really was the first film to take on Nazi Germany and show these ideas, this ideology needs to be attacked. It needs to be exposed and attacked and shown for what it is, and we need to stand up to it, even if it means fighting a war against it. That film ultimately was not that successful in 1939, but the next year, yeah, The Mortal Storm from MGM, uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it exposes the brutality of the Nazi regime. It treads very lightly when actually talking about its victims. There is a great moment where Frank Morgan, you know, the wizard from The Wizard of Oz, he plays a character named Professor Roth, obviously Jewish, uh, who is sent to a concentration camp. And we do see him wearing a, an armband that has the letter J on it. And that's the only acknowledgement really that he's Jewish in the film. Uh, the word Jew is never spoken. Jewish is never spoken. Uh, but just seeing that J, everyone knows what that means. And, yeah, and that's you, a powerful moment. But, but yes, and I, I think it's definitely true that of course you, it, you know what it means. Although I'm struck by, by how many people know what it means, how, how many people I know uh, who wouldn't instinctively know offhand that Roth was a Jewish name. And, and it does say a little something that uh, they couldn't show him wearing the Jewish star that Jews, of course, actually would have worn, the gold star. So, so they made it a J. I mean, credit to them for doing something. I, I agree. But it just, it, 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 while being a breakthrough moment, it also gives you a little insight into what those who wanted to tell the story were up against. Because anti-Semitism was also widespread throughout the U.S., there was a recognition by Jewish executives in Hollywood that just appealing to the idea that Jewish people were being persecuted and generating sympathy for them would not be enough for a lot of Americans to condone the idea of going to war again. And that's a very yeah. sad thing to consider, but that, that is part of the, motiv the motivating factor there. Yeah, my, my last thought on the, uh, this part uh, before we uh, uh, move into the work that Hollywood did uh, uh, during the war, um, uh, you know, you include, you include a, a lot of polling data in your book, which I love, um, and uh, uh, that after Kristallnacht in November of 1938, uh, uh, Americans were coming around to the idea that uh, the Jews didn't bring this on themselves. There was a change in the polling there. But still, even after Kristallnacht, 67 percent, two thirds of all Americans did not want to open up our shores, not only not merely to, to Jews fleeing persecution in Europe, but to their children that right. we didn't, we didn't even want two thirds of Americans didn't even feel right letting in Jewish children uh, to escape Nazi Germany as late as 1938. Again, an example of, of it, it wasn't just Hollywood and, and the, the Hollywood censors and Congress that the, the body politic of America wanted no part of this and did not have overwhelming sympathy for the plight of those persecuted by the Nazis. I'm, I'm afraid that's, that's terribly true. You're, you're absolutely right, that there was no desire by the majority of Americans to welcome Jewish refugee children who would otherwise be killed 
back in Nazi controlled territory is just shocking and uh, unbelievably sad. So there's a wonderful point you make uh, before, you know, obviously the United States enters the war December 7th, 1941. And then in a moment that still has historians somewhat confounded four days later, December 11th, uh, Hitler uh, and Italy uh, declare war on the United States, um, uh, saving us the problem of figuring out how to go to war with Germany. Um, so, but your point is that perhaps the most important years for the for Hollywood uh, the, uh, during the war were the was 1940 and the first 11 months of 1941 before uh, December 7th. Uh, uh, why do you make that point? There was an element of laying the groundwork by the Hollywood studios to prepare for war. Certain really foresighted directors had an idea that war was on the horizon. Um, John Ford actually started making films for the Navy you know, in 1940, he made a film about sex hygiene for recruits. Um, and that it's actually, a great, great film, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. considered so gruesome that he would just throw up whenever he would see it. It, it is a grisly film uh, for those of you who are brave enough to check it out. Uh, just the, the depiction of venereal disease is quite, quite brutal. Uh, but uh, hang on, just because it's such a great quote. Uh, I think uh, it made its point, said Ford, and helped a lot of young kids. I looked at it and threw up, he said. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was worth quoting him there. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, directors like Ford, you know, and, and, and Capra and uh, Marion C. Cooper, you know, knew that war was on the horizon, that it was inevitable. And, and eventually some of the, the studio bosses really started to realize that. To too. Tell, tell people, Marion C. Cooper made King Kong in 1933. Uh, tell people, because I, I think many don't know, uh, what he did. Well, it's really extraordinary. He went to China in, in the years leading up to Pearl Harbor and helped create an American expeditionary flyer unit there, which ultimately became known as the Flying Tigers. And it was up to about 100 American pilots who served essentially as the Chinese National Air Force at a time when the Chinese nationalist government, uh, led by Chiang Kai-shek against the Japanese invaders, did not have really an air force of its own. And so these, these flying tigers were so revered and, and beloved that actually to the, right now in China, there are like 50 different museums devoted to the flying tigers. They remain such a source of inspiration and, and a source like even as Sino-American relations became so strained in the decades after, a source of remembrance and possible connection again. And actually during the COVID pandemic, at, right at the start, uh, the, the, uh, uh, flying, some of the Flying Tigers museums in China actually donated money to various veterans groups in the U.S. That, that is a sign of the connection that is still there. Uh, how significant, there's a question we got from uh, an audience member that, that uh, is perfect because I was about to ask it myself, um, uh, but uh, how important were the films made in 1940 and 1941, not just the work that Marion C. Cooper and, and, and John Ford did, obviously recognizing what was happening, Jimmy Stewart, and we'll certainly, again, second mention of Jimmy Stewart, we got to tell people what Jimmy Stewart did during the war. Um, uh, but how important were those movies in setting the uh, and laying the groundwork sort of in influencing American opinion about the necessity of war? And specifically, of course, uh, a movie that uh, it, it appears Adolf Hitler may have watched twice uh, uh, by uh, requested twice himself. Uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. Well, you can tell that the national mood was beginning to shift a little bit in 1940 because The Great, Di the Great Dictator actually did end up as one of the top 10 box office hits of that year. So that's really significant because The Great Dictator doesn't just lampoon Nazis. It actually does generate sympathy for Jewish characters who are explicitly Jewish characters. Their Jewish identity is foregrounded. Uh, Chaplin himself plays a Jewish barber. So that's really important. So I think that film, along with 20th Century Fox's Manhunt, uh, along with even just like the Three Stooges lampooned the Nazis all of a sudden. You know, in The Great Dictator, you've got the countries of uh, Tomania and Bacteria, which are like Germany and Italy. And uh, for the Three Stooges, 
uh, it, it, in a uh, you nasty spy, it was, uh, the country there was Moronica, which I love. Uh, but, you know, people were starting to come around and starting to, it, it, you know, I don't know if people wanted to go to war, but they were at least starting to realize, okay, the Nazis are bad guys. And the studio heads, for their part of making all these films, were saying, you know what, we actually don't care about the German market anymore. We don't care about losing our biggest international market. We can't do business with these guys. We're done. Because even just a couple of years earlier, uh, when uh, Chaplin, who, by the way, I, I think and I, uh, Chaplin himself didn't know how to answer this question because he wasn't Jewish. And I think perhaps because of the power of, of the great dictator, many people presume that he was Jewish and he never wanted to answer it either way because he didn't want to say no. Like he was, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the answer he wanted to give was no, but I'd be proud to be. Um, yeah, right. exactly. I mean, that's the kind of thing, like there's no good answer you could give that question because yeah, if you say no, it seems like you're denying it and that you'd be ashamed to be Jewish or something. If you say yes, then, you know, you're lying. And uh, so just, and, but, but, I was let me just say that but, but I wanted to get to just a couple of years earlier. It was uh, he his pro- the production for the Great Dictator was was halted. That's right. That's absolutely right. He, uh, you know, th- there was just he couldn't really get financing for it. There was a real sense that he might, uh, maybe he could make life worse for Jews who are living there. Um, that was a real that was a real concern, um, and I think there was just such a, a uh, among the, the artists of the day, the, 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 the auteurs, there was a real feeling of how do we grapple with this? How can we just use comedy, say, to deal with Hitler? Uh, there's, that, there's this amazing moment where Chaplin and Louis Bunuel and Rene Clare went to MoMA in New York City to see Triumph of the Will, Lenny Reifenstahl film glorifying Hitler. And Rene Claire and Louis Benoit were just devastated. They, they were like, how can we possibly stand up to this? This is whereas Chaplin was just like howling, like it was howling laughter for him the whole time. He thought it was so funny. This is so ridiculous. This is so self-evidently absurd. How could anyone buy into this? And it was that that kernel that even though his production had been shut down, that made him want to revisit it and get back to it uh, and, and ultimately make one of his best films, I think. Uh, Renee Claire and Louis Boonwell and Charlie Chaplin just <laughs> hanging out and <laughs> going a moment to see uh, Riefenthal's uh, movie. Is, uh, that just, I mean, like, what did they do after? Like, where did they go to lunch? <laughs> what did they talk <laughs> about? You know, uh, I love that stuff. Uh, you know, uh, to uh, my grandfather, uh, Herman Mankiewicz, who was the subject of the uh, Netflix film uh, Mank, you know, he wrote a... <laughs> He wrote a screenplay, and as you know, in, in 1933, the year Hitler came to power, called uh, Mad Dog Europe, about a madman who takes over uh, uh, Germany. Um, and just to, in case there was any confusion, you know, sometimes they changed the names. Uh, Herman changed the name. The lead carrier, the, the dangerous uh, madman taking over the country, was named Adolf Mittler. Because ah. <laughs> he didn't want anybody to be confused. Um <laughs> uh, and uh, and that movie, you know, I mean, I've read this, as you may have as well, the letters back and forth between uh, the various people who were going to produce it at times and the production code office. They had, there was just no interest in making this movie. None, none. And, and, and so, you know, a couple of starts and then throughout the 30s and even in almost into 1940. And then uh, and then also by then, my grandfather had certainly lost his cachet uh, until he got it back for a minute <laughs> with uh, with Citizen Kane. Um, so. How important was this groundwork that you say? Well, obviously we know it was important, but what did, what did it do? Like, did it uh, did it persuade uh, moviegoers? Who who was most persuaded by this? It persuaded ordinary moviegoers to realize that the Nazis were were evil, which was really important because a lot of people didn't feel that before these films. So that was essential, uh, and and it also just laid the groundwork for sort of a, a deeper sense in, in the collective American psyche that, you know, whether we like it or not, whether we start it or not, whether we get into it ourselves, we're probably going to end up in this war. And w- it'll be a shock when it happens, but we shouldn't be too shocked. And I think that was the attitude that pe- a lot of people had when December 7th happened. You know, it was a sneak attack. It was... It was not something that, you know, 
people just thought, oh yeah, this was an inevitability for sure. But there was a, a feeling like, okay, this has happened. We had an idea that it might happen. Now we need to spring into action and face this threat from Germany and Japan and, and defeat it. it. It sounds to me also as, as if uh, that when the Nazis in, invaded Poland on September 1st, uh, 1939, that although there was still a very strong isolationist sentiment in the United States, um, it became much harder uh, to deny the threat of the Nazis, allowing 19, the films in 1940 and 1941 uh, to flourish, to happen, to, to head into production. And also just what was happening to Britain, you know, our, our closest ally, such a strong cultural tie for so many in the U.S. And seeing, you know, London being bombed to smithereens during the Blitz and, and all across the country and the threat of invasion there. I think that really woke up a lot of parents. You, you, there's a couple of things. I mean, there's, this book is littered with information, and I know a fair amount about the war and Hollywood's role in the war. And there's just so much in here that I that I didn't know that is, uh, but I never even put together that Hitchcock's foreign correspondent, which has uh, Joel McRae talking about, uh, you know, at the end of the film, right? Um, yeah. Um, you know, talking about the bombs falling on London, the lights going out all over the world. We got to keep the lights on in America, and we got to you know put guns around the lights and protect the lights. The Blitzkrieg hadn't even started yet. Uh, that just you presume that it that that must be happening, but it's that not. A, That's really a stunning piece of movie trivia. That's Alfred Hitchcock just being a bit of a prophet there, because yeah. at that point it was just so obvious that something was going to happen. So when Foreign Correspondent opened, you know the Blitz was just starting. The, the kind of what it depicts at the end there with Joel McRae you know, giving that speech, you know, keep the lights on America, you're the last light in the world and all this, uh, you know, as the bombs are falling in London, that was shot months before, but it was just like, this is going to happen eventually, we're going to get there. And so when the movie comes out, it's actually happening for real. It's, it's uncanny. Yeah, so the uh, you know, my, my grandfather's uh, unproduced uh, film there, Mad Dog of Europe, it got him banned by uh, Goebbels, uh, Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, banned all Herman Mankiewicz movies in, in Nazi Germany, which is a huge badge of honor. It was in my grandfather's New York Times obituary. Um, and uh, uh, Warner Brothers films were banned in Nazi Germany after confessions of a Nazi spy, correct, in, in, in 1939. And then there's other chilling little piece of data that you have is that after the Nazis invaded Poland, they rounded up seven owners of theaters who had... Uh, shown the film, I guess, in Poland. Um, yeah. uh, 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 and hanged. Well, when the film came out, right, and they rounded them up and they hanged. Yeah, I mean, for just yeah. having shown Confessions of a Nazi Spy, it's, uh, there were also retaliations against uh, some, uh, some people who had just gone to see the movie. Uh, it's really extraordinary. Uh, in, in Kevin Brownlow's uh, 2002 documentary, The Tramp and the Dictator, there's a great story um, the shared there as well about just the visceral reaction that like the great dictator uh, ex uh, inspired in German troops who were uh, forced to see it. It went, it was, it was, there was this incident in Serbia, I think occupied Serbia where uh, someone actually like swapped in a copy of the great dictator and a German soldier, like, you know, 30 minutes into it, it took the crowd that long to realize what was going on. Like just actually like machine gun the screen um, no, I mean, movies are powerful. And that's the thing that, you know, if you have to hang a number of movie theater owners just for showing a movie, yeah. that shows how powerful movies are. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and certainly uh, President Roosevelt uh, recognized uh, uh, early on, and in fact, it lent significant uh, support to Chaplin, correct? Um, uh, to, 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 to press ahead and make the the great dictator Roosevelt in general recognized that there was a critical role to be played, a, cr a, a critical propaganda role to be played uh, in Hollywood for the war effort. Absolutely. No question about it. You know, this was a time when the average American went to the movies twice a week. You know, that, that's absolutely incredible. Just the, the sheer amount of time and investment that most Americans actually had in the motion picture business. 
And so FDR recognized that, you know, he actually said that, you know, entertainment is useful in peacetime, but indispensable in a time of war, you know, to rally people, to get their, you know, emotions riled up, but also to give them a sense of what they were fighting for and what they could look forward to when the conflict was over. Um, And there's some instances, you know, where movies could even model good behavior to follow. You know, there was uh, Veronica Lake famously had her very long hair in movies like I Married a Witch. You know, she was a real bombshell of the early 40s. And uh, but with women now going into the war industries, working in factories at heavy machinery all hours of the day, long hair was not to be valued. You needed to put that hair up or cut it. And so she put her hair up into what was called a victory role and and made a number of movies with this short hair. Arguably, it ruined her career, but it did model the kind of behavior that women were supposed to follow during the war. And there are all kinds of examples like that from the war years that I think are so interesting, where it's like movies are really sending messages that people can follow in order to achieve ultimate victory. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I until I read... Um, Really, until I read, uh, and we had him on uh, TCM for a, a, a month, uh, uh, Mark Harris and his wonderful book, Five Came Back, about the five uh, directors who we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll be talking about here, um, who went over to make movies uh, uh, for the country to support the war effort and to shoot documentary footage. And, uh, um, that, uh, you know, that the word propaganda you know, it's not just the Soviets and the Nazis who engage in propaganda. I mean, it's so obvious, right? And propaganda can, of course, if the cause is good, be just. We all engage in propaganda, right? I mean, publicity and propaganda, they're, you know, they go hand in hand. Um, so these were uh, the, these were uh, 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 propaganda films. Roosevelt recognized that we needed to sell the war effort because the sacrifice that he was going to expect Americans to make was significant. And he asked Hollywood to make that same sacrifice. And really, with very few exceptions, uh, Hollywood, it took them a while. But when they stepped up, they stepped up big. They certainly did. They certainly did. Uh, Capra went to Washington, D.C. almost immediately after Pearl Harbor. Well, he did finish up uh, Arsenic and Old Lace. But uh, by January of 1942, at least, like five or six weeks after Pearl Harbor, he went to D.C. and opened up uh, an office at the Library of Congress, uh, brought in screenwriters uh, like the Epstein brothers who worked on uh, Casablanca, Julius and Philip Epstein, and, uh, and, and began the creation of the Why We Fight films uh, for that very reason. You know, the average American, you know, high school diploma, no college education, I mean, didn't really know what was happening, you know, in Europe throughout the 1930s. That's part of why there was all this isolation sentiment. And certainly, you know, they don't know what's happening with like Operation Barbarossa, you know, Germany invading the Soviet Union or something like this. They thought, you know, Soviet Union were were bad guys for a while. You know, uh, so those films were absolutely critical for, yes, being propaganda, sponsored by the government, funded by the government, uh, but utilizing Hollywood talent in, in a really powerful way. And then what I think is so interesting is that you see elements of propaganda suffusing even, you know, non-government funded films, you know, films just being made by Hollywood in general as entertainment um, for, for the next few years. And, and there's that component of it as well. It's not just like everyone in Hollywood is being told what to do by the government. Yeah, it was a-, a remarkable feeling of everyone was kind of on the same page. Yeah, I mean, let's uh, uh, discuss. Uh, uh, well, first you mentioned uh, cast. Well, first of all, let me like, because we mentioned it. Those those directors: you, uh, Frank Capra, uh, uh, John Ford, uh, William Wyler, John Huston, George Stevens, uh, who all served and made these vitally uh, important films. And they, they're just the five uh, best known directors, but but many uh, went and served. Um, uh, uh, but you, Casablanca. For example, I mean, nobody nobody mandated they make a, uh, a, a propaganda film about North Africa, right? And set in a bar. That's just that was just Hal Wallace thinking that that was a good idea. But this is one of my favorite little facts because that treatment for Casablanca, which was adapted from an unproduced play called "Everybody Goes to Ricks" or "Comes to Ricks." Um, uh, had been in the hands of uh, Warner Brothers script readers for some time. Uh, but 
it was on Monday, September 8th, or maybe a couple of days after that week, I think that a, that a guy in Hal Wallace's unit uh, named Stephen Carnot, I think is his name, read it. And I always think like, first of all, he went in on December 8th, Monday, right? I, I would have taken the day off, right? Um, uh, and, uh, but he goes in and he reads it. And if he'd read it on Thursday the 4th, it just might not have resonated in the same way that had him think, you know, this is sophisticated hokum, as he said, like, you know, praised it and then thought it'd be good for Bogart and sent it up the chain to where it eventually reached Hal Wallace. Uh, that's just a this wonderful little bit of Hollywood kismet working perfectly that he read it on December 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor. And there's so many things like that yeah. throughout Hollywood history of this time. I mean, that's incredible that you know he, he read that on December 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor. But then how amazing that when the film actually came out, when Casablanca was ready in late 1942, yeah, right. uh, it, it coincided with the, the Allied landings in Morocco. So suddenly Morocco was in the news. Casablanca was in the news. It was like this movie could not be more relevant. In addition to being a metaphor for the experience of the entire That's country. Right. That's going right. from being isolationist to waking up to this very real threat and realizing that we had to engage with that, which that film does better than any other. Uh, how did uh, uh, you've mentioned Veronica Lake? I've mentioned Jimmy Stewart twice. How did uh, we've talked a little bit about the directors? Uh, uh, how did uh, actors, uh, you know, men and women who were the, the, the faces of the movie industry in general, how, how did they respond? To, uh, so, uh, to uh, December 7th. On December 20th, 1941, they all got together. A, a whole bunch of the most glittering A-listers in Hollywood got together at the Roosevelt Hotel to uh, form the Hollywood Victory Committee. And that would sur- stand throughout the entire war to organize war bonds, rallies and fundraisers and tours um, and various, you know, outreach shows, you know, events to entertain the troops uh, and something as really unique as the Hollywood victory caravan, which got underway a few months later in 1942, which was a train tour from LA to Washington DC in which all these amazing stars, Cary Grant, you know, Laurel and Hardy, you know, just basically practically everyone you can name uh, Bing Crosby joined at Chicago Um you know, went to, went to Washington, D.C., met with FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt, had, you know, all their photos taken on the lawn of the White House, and then went on this multi-city tour to raise money for the war effort. You know, and this was a time where, yeah, of course, people pay their taxes. Tax rates were much higher than, than they are now. Uh, and, you know, that was important for funding the war effort. But, no, people at that time were willing to pay more than their taxes by taking out war bonds, you know, by taking, and the idea was that, you know, you give your money to the government and then after the war, you'll get it back with nominal interest. Uh, and in the meantime, that can be used to actually, you know, fight the war. And so all of these stars contributed to that. And actually we've got uh, a little clip here, which is sort of a reenactment. Now, mind you, this is from 1945. This actually was from right as the war was wrapping up, but it shows you it gives you a real sense of what that Hollywood Victory Caravan train tour would have been like in 1942. Should, should we show that first clip? Yeah, let's see. Uh, this is the first clip, yeah? This is the Bing, the Bing Crosby clip. Crosby, so, uh, yeah. let's, uh, let's see. Boys like him that were doing his victory caravan. Well, it's certainly little enough to do. Look at the fruit salad on his chest there, huh? Looks like your big brother's been up where they really play for keeps. And all they ask us to do is to buy victory bonds. Honey, we're going to get you on that train if we have to make the engineer get off and walk. Riding through here, Carmen Cavallaro's going to give us some very good Gershwin. I got rhythm. You want to go over there with me and sit down and see what we can figure out? Of course, we can listen a little, too. <laughs> Thank you. 
today, Carmen. Thank you, Bing. Say, I have an idea. What's this? Why don't you and Bob Hope double up in your lower berth? Oh, I'd hate to ask them to do that. Oh, I don't mind, but uh, Hope may be a little difficult. You see, this is the first time he's ever had a chance to ride inside the train. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go to Bob and tell him your story? Yes, and then he'll tell you his story, and you better have your track shoes on. Oh, I'm kidding, honey. He's, he's really a very sympathetic, understanding man. He'll probably show you his scrapbook, and then you can both have a good cry. Go to him. I will, and, and thank you very much. Bye. Bye. The uh, uh, Carmen Cavallero could play the piano. Who would not open up their wallet with yeah. a payment like that? You know, you just yeah. immediately have to buy a war bond. Uh, now, at that, that line, uh, look at the fruit salad on his chest. That yeah. to me is like the quintessential Bing Crosby joke. I, yeah. I love that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just perfect. It's, it's a perfect object. I love that. Uh, but you know that's the kind of that is the kind of entertainment that that really did get people to part with their money and uh, you know that that initial tour of the, of the Hollywood Victory Caravan was just a, a rousing success, no doubt about it. And, it, and it inspired stars to continue doing that all throughout the war. Um, you know those who weren't actually in uniform themselves. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. You know just to but but if you think about it, there was something really unique at that time because. It's not like people around the country had ever thought that they would have an opportunity to see any of their favorite actors up close. And now suddenly they can. They're coming to them. They're coming to Chicago. They're coming to Baltimore. They're coming to Boston. You know, they're going to Philadelphia. It's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. Uh, and actually, we have a second clip. Uh, yeah, I, 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 like the sec- I like the second clip because for all the, the brightness and energy that uh, Bing Crosby and Carmen Cavallaro bring to the first clip, uh, Humphrey Bogart uh, essentially plays Rick Blaine uh, in this next clip. Uh, and he is, uh, well, he's just Humphrey Bogart. This is after the war, right? This this would have been put together yes. then. Yeah, that's right. So what he's saying here is he's actually sort of talking about the GI Bill. So this is, you know, after the war, this actually came out in October of 1945. And so he's addressing the viewers at that moment, even though they're recreating this event from the start of the war. Uh, but yeah, there is a degree of lethargy here on Bogey's part. And uh, well, I think that the lethargy may be because, as you're about to see, uh, Bogey needs a new belt. <laughs> he does. He does. Uh, I think with that, what better tease could we give them that? Roll it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Humphrey Bogart. We've had a lot of bond drives. You people have proven by your magnificent response to each one of them that you know exactly why they were necessary. We've also had a lot of patriotic speeches. I'm sure you don't need another one from me to tell you why we need this victory loan. You know why it's important that we make this victory loan the smashing climax of all bond drives. Our fighting men have just won history's greatest victory for freedom. They didn't stop until they finished their job. It's up to us not to stop buying bonds until we finish our part of the job. We've got to bring those boys home. It's up to us to see that they get what they were promised and what they have every right to expect in medical care, hospitalization, rehabilitation, and economic opportunity. Your victory loan dollars will fulfill your pledge to the men who won the victory. This is the last chance victory loan. It's your last chance as a member of an organized civilian army to buy bonds for their future and for your own future. This theater staff stands ready at all times, day or night, to sell you victory loan bonds. With your help, this theater staff has a magnificent record in seven war loan campaigns. They have a quota in this victory loan. And it's part of the state's, your city's quota. I uh, I just I don't know, man. I I can't help it. I love Bogart. I don't care what he does. I don't care if his belt does. I just it's so I'm like almost to me more than the first one. I'd be like, yeah, I got to give him some money. First of all, Bogey needs a new belt. But I just he's even with him pulling up his pants there at the beginning. Maybe not the best way to start. I don't know. I feel like it's an affect. Like he needed to have a little actor's business. That's what I true. Yeah, I think that's what it was. But I don't. Anyway, I still liked it. I still loved it. Um, I tell you what, let's uh, let's fly through these. What's the third one? Yeah. So the third one is uh, reconnaissance pilot actually starting a young 
I think this is the training film. Isn't the third one the training film? I don't want to get us, uh, or did we? Yeah, so that's that's the one where uh, William Holden plays a flyer, and it's giving a message about how. Well, the clip we're about to see is about what you can, what will be waiting for you, and you'll be looking forward to when. I think. Hold on. I think that's the fourth clip, and I want to make sure, unless we've ditched one of them. Isn't there a third one about the mo- all the movies that are sort of that uh, the, that yeah, were made? No, there's also movies at war as well. Oh, I have them in the reverse order, so let's go ahead. I'm sure you're correct, and if it's not, uh, you'll you, first of all they're self-explanatory. So yeah, of course, <laughs> absolutely. Well, movies at war is really interesting because that tells you a little bit about first of all 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 these clips. I guess we should have said from the start these are all you know in the National Archives collection. Uh, you know, these are available to watch on YouTube anytime. So we're just showing little clips. You can watch the whole thing. But Movies at War is interesting because that's about how the motion picture industry mobilized in general. So there were 30,000 members of the motion picture industry in Hollywood who actually joined up, got in uniform, uh, and, and you know, entered the service in one way or another themselves. And uh, this tells a little bit about... Uh, what those movies did to uh, inspire the troops who saw them. Yesterday, USA. Sights and sounds left behind for the duration, but never forgotten. The motion picture is seen to that. It follows the soldier to the far reaches of battle. Bright lights, laughter, home for those who thirst for sights and sounds not alien to American eyes and ears. From the first day he's in camp, motion pictures play a varied role in the average soldier's life. Not only is he entertained by them, he's also oriented and trained through the medium of the silver screen. Training films boast a worldwide attendance of 30 million GIs monthly. To date, the Army has produced 708 training films. The industry adds 101 as its nonprofit contribution. Army operated libraries supply the armed forces with all types of films and equipment for projection of motion pictures. 260 libraries in this country, approximately 60 overseas booking soaring into astronomical figures, a barometer for gauging the response of the using branches to films designed solely for the military. And there's no denying Johnny Doughboy's interest in the Fighting Men series, a 100% Hollywood product providing grim training lessons. To fully appreciate their popularity is to reveal that five million soldiers monthly attend screenings of the Fighting Men film. These and thousands of additional reels shown and re-shown must necessarily receive careful handling. Inspection and repair of films and machines occupy soldier technicians skilled at this type of work. Equipment that gives life to precious celluloids such as the Why We Fight orientation films fashioned by Hollywood trained craftsmen. Worldwide army release alone requires 225 prints per subject. Dramatic to the extent of arousing those who must meet the common enemy. This series goes a long way toward familiarizing our soldiers and the nation with the fitness and ruthlessness of the foe. Britain and Russia display wide interest in these and other United States Army films. Yeah, so, uh, and then because we teased it, let's just uh, jump right ahead to William Holden. In what I think is his most challenging role, a man thinking and saying nothing and hardly blinking. Here's the last one. It's short.
Ford. You envy that kid next to you. Swabbies can sleep anywhere. But you can't sleep because you're keyed up. You're going home. Home to Culver Springs. You've been out there 14 months and you're tired. Dog tired. You're tired from flying 52 long, tough combat missions in a P-38. But you feel good about one thing. You're going home. And when you land, she'll be waiting for you at the airport. Catherine. She'll be there. And when you feel her in your arms, those 14 months will melt away like a ground haze in the morning sun. Packard A. Cummings, 1st Lieutenant Army Air Forces, dog tag number 0451859. You're headed for home, and Catherine will be waiting. I'm sorry, I, uh, I didn't realize that he had to take a pillow and put it behind his head. There was, he, did, he, did have, he, did have, he did have some business. It was some heavy thinking that he was doing there and required the pillow for support. But I, you know, when, it, when I saw that the first time we were, you know, we've been discussing this day for a while and I saw that clip and I was like, that's William Holt. Wait, that's William Holt. That's not Parker Cummings. That's William Holt. He's only 24 or 25 there, which is extraordinary. You know, he'd been in, uh, he'd started one major film before the yeah, war. Go, go, Golden yeah. Boy. Yeah, exactly. You know, he was only like 20 or 21 in that film yeah. for Columbia with Barbara Stanwyck. And uh, so, you know, then like so many, he ends up uh, in, in uniform and uh, found that he was suited to making, a, making films for the armed forces like that. You know, so many others did that as well. Uh, uh, you know, Gene Kelly did that. He, he was making documentaries in Washington, D.C. Uh, well, let me ask you about some of the better known uh, folks. And I want to get to a couple of questions no. that we have here. You have a nice little moment in your book of talking about where some people were on December 7th. John Ford, oddly, was having lunch with an admiral in the Navy. Yes. <laughs> um, in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. Uh, where was uh, this could say where where because it's really relevant where where Jimmy Stewart was because he was already in the service. So he had already been in the army for nine months at that point. So he was at a California air base. Uh, I think it was near San Mateo. And uh, he, you know, had at that point uh, passed basic training, you know, which then meant that he could apply for the army air forces he's 32 years old at this point. Like the, the average recruit for any kind of aerial service was like 23, like 26, absolute limit. Uh, 32 was really unheard of. And the fact that he would join up nine months before Pearl Harbor is a really extraordinary thing. In, in part, it shows how dissatisfied he had been with the movies that he had been making up to that point. Um, a lot of the films that he had made after Mr. Smith goes to Washington, he felt really lacked guts, including the film for which he, he won the Oscar, The Philadelphia Story. Um, he, he was not a fan of his performance in that. For, you know, he won Best Actor. He felt it should have gone to his friend Henry Fonda for uh, The Grapes of Wrath. And, uh, you know, he, like, like some who were more foresighted, realized that war was inevitable. So he wanted to be a part of it and he wanted to shape it. And he felt ultimately that he could make a more meaningful contribution in uniform than he could in Hollywood. And what he does in the years after Pearl Harbor is just extraordinary. Uh, tell, tell people a little of, of what he did for those who don't know. Yeah. So he commanded B-24s over Europe, over occupied Europe on bombing missions uh, that saw, you know, some of his companions killed, uh, saw his planes shot up, um, you know, and, and by the end, you know, as the war moved on, he kept getting promoted, you know, up and up the ranks of, of the Air Forces until, you know, he was a colonel and, uh, you know, he was commanding squad. He did not fly on D-Day, uh, as some have reported. Uh, he did not, but he was uh, commanding squadrons from uh, uh, Buckingham in uh, in West Ang in um, uh, East Anglia, and uh, was was you know giving orders to squadrons, you know, uh, hitting targets leading up to the invasion on, uh, on June 6, nineteen forty four. He had the responsibility of of dozens, hundreds of men, hundreds. right? Uh, many of whom, of course, uh, did not come back, and uh, you know now we know. We know to say that Jimmy Stewart 
suffered from PTSD, uh, yeah. significant PTSD. Um, back then, shell shock, and there was some, you know, degree of shame in it, right? Like you weren't tough enough. So like everybody else, he would have, he would have hit it or done it. He would have tried his best uh, to hide it. But uh, Jimmy Stewart, who signed up, as you say, nine months before Pearl Harbor, was a, a, a genuine war hero. And, and that day, you even right, which I didn't know, he was a corporal. He had just been promoted to corporal and he retired from the reserves, I think, in the 19 in, during Vietnam as a brigadier general. Which is one of the most remarkable career tracks for anyone in the U.S. military in history, because he started as a private first class. And yeah, by the time that, yeah, of course, by the time of Vietnam and all, he was in the reserves and hadn't actually you know, done anything. It was more ceremonial. But yeah, to actually be a brigadier general, that's an extraordinary career path. And, a, uh, and shows that he really, he, he truly fought in this war. I mean, it, what he did in commanding all of these lives, uh, commanding all of these men and, and risking his own life. I mean, he, he flew himself in about 23, 24 missions actually over Europe himself, putting himself in harm's way. And um, it's, it's an incredible thing. He was not Adolf Hitler's favorite actor. That was Clark Gable, who also flew missions uh, as a gunner on uh, B-17 bombers. Clark Gable's uh, on the Clark Gable's on the there cover he is, of the book. There he yeah. is with, with, yeah. with his uh, you know his ammunition, and uh, yeah, he was a gunner on on B-17s and and also a documentarian. Uh, he took some remarkable color footage of aerial combat, which became another film called uh, Combat America, uh, which you can see on YouTube, and uh, it, it's an amazing color document of the war. But you know, he he flew only about six missions over. Uh, over Europe, uh, but there was on one of those, you know, a huge anti-aircraft shell came ripping through the, the fuselage of his plane and, you know, just like inches past his head. I think it actually even did hit a little bit of his boot and nipped a little bit of the, the boot, uh, a little bit of the leather off his boot. So it came that close to killing him. Um, he was Adolf Hitler's favorite actor and there was even a bounty out on him that if any German pilot could shoot down Clark Gable, and they could bring him back to the Fuhrer, that would have been quite a prize. And, and one can only imagine uh, how horrific, what, you know, what would have ensued. Um, uh, it's a question uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the audience, from the chat uh, anyway, uh, uh, a good question. Uh, what was uh, Walt Disney's uh, contribution? It was not insignificant. Oh, it manifold. Uh, so we, we, we saw there in the movies at war clip about how the motion picture industry had been mobilized in part to create training films for people in uniform. Um, and Walt Disney was a huge part of that. He, right after Pearl Harbor, was commissioned by the Navy to make 20 training films. And we're talking stuff like a little animated film about how to use a tank busting gun, like very basic stuff, like, you know, definitely given some Disney personality, but not, you know, anything that you necessarily would go out of your way to watch, you know, as like a Disney fan today, you know, it's not, it's not going to be, you know, something that you're going to find in the vault necessarily. But, uh, you know, he, he, it was pretty incredible. I mean, the, the way in which he personally uh, met the challenge of World War II is extraordinary because just the day after Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, he's waking up, stunned like everyone in, in the country is at that point. And he gets a call from someone at his studio, which had just opened in Burbank, this huge campus. And, uh, you know, one of his production executives says, Walt, the army is moving in on us. And actually, it turns out that like 800 uh, army, you know, anti-aircraft gunners were stationed there for a number of months uh, after Pearl Harbor, because there was such a fear that the Japanese would invade the West Coast that, you know, we need to have these gunners stationed here just in case. Now it's in Burbank, so it's not quite in Hollywood Central, so it won't cause a panic to have them stationed there. But they're also close to a lot of like you know aircraft factories and everything, just in case they do need to spring into action. Yeah, I I, I, I took it when I read that uh, in, in your book that, that that was the real reason. I mean, and and a totally valid reason is to protect the factories, right? Absolutely. To protect the aircraft or the munitions factories that we. Uh, uh, that we had there and here in uh, in Southern California. So yeah, so uh, U.S. troops moved in. I like the line yeah. you have. The guy calls Disney and he's like, "I told them 
that I have to call you first. And the guy says, the army says, go, yeah, you can go ahead and call him, but we're moving in. Like, but feel free to call your boss, <laughs> but we're still coming. Yep. Exactly. No matter what, Walt Disney was very powerful at that point. You know, uh, other than Gone with the Wind, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was uh, arguably the biggest hit in, in the history of Hollywood. Um, that was such a massive film. That's what allowed him to build such a big studio in the first place. But also he sunk so much money into it that then he had all these debts, which the Warriors actually really helped him pay off because of all these government contracts, making training films, uh, going on this, even before the war, even before Pearl Harbor, he went on this whole tour of South America as a part of cultural diplomacy to reach out to Brazil and Argentina and Chile, countries that at the time were considering joining the Axis. And, uh, and thankfully did not, in part due to the cultural diplomacy of people like Disney and Orson Welles and, you know, in reverse, Carmen Miranda coming to the U.S. Um, you know, so, I mean, Disney's contribution was huge. He, there was even, um, you know, he made this film called Victory Through Air Power, which is very strange. It's basically just like him endorsing this whole concept of building like long range bombers that could he thought win the war very hypothetical it's so weird to imagine like bob Iger or bob chapik now uh you know coming up with a film to present to the government like this is how you should conduct your warfare uh that would never happen today but you know there was actually a bomb visualized in that that had like rocket engines to it that ultimately was developed before the end of the war, uh, developed by the British actually to be like a bunker busting bomb. And it was actually called, the Brits called it the Disney bomb. So that is the level of impact that Walt Disney had. He even had a bomb named after him. Uh, R- Roosevelt uh, and the Roosevelt administration really understood the value of, of putting people like Walt Disney and Orson Welles uh, uh, to work. And in an enormously valuable way, as you say, these countries, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, these were uh, countries that 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 the that the Nazis were interested in. Right. And 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 thought that there was headway to be made there. And so sending these guys down there to sort of as a continuation of what had been Roosevelt's good neighbor policy during the 1930s, so like a, a good neighbor plus policy here. Uh, there was a strategic advantage to using these famous movie stars and executives to uh, uh, to advance the war effort. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and Orson Welles was already in South America uh, on the night of the Academy Awards in 1942. And, yeah. and you know, he and your grandfather uh, shared the Oscar for uh, for best original screenplay for for Citizen Kane. And. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that cultural out, outreach and diplomacy was so invaluable, I have to say. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. I mean, you can say that, like, Wells himself took on so much stuff at this time. You know, he would be then making a show, like, for the radio about uh, aviation on top of this, plus trying to finish Journey into Fear, plus, you know, Magnificent Ambersons gets completely, you know, discarded, you know, in the meantime, you know, that, of course, his career really suffered as a result. But uh, at the mention of your grandfather there, uh, I'm really curious, you know, your father, you know, unfortunately, of course, you never knew your grandfather, uh, Herman Mankiewicz, because he died in 1953. But your father uh, served in World War II himself. He was 17 when Pearl Harbor uh, happened. And can, can you tell us a little bit like what you heard about Hollywood during World War II through him? Yeah, I mean, my dad was uh, uh, 17 years old, as, uh, as you said, uh, on, on December 7th, 1941. He was returning from playing softball, playing a doubleheader on Sunday, which he always uh, uh, played when he heard it on the news, you know, around, uh, you know, around 1130 in the morning, I think, uh, Pacific time. And uh, as soon as he turned uh, 18 in May, he signed up you know and and i always say you know as a kid and i'd say i was so brave you didn't wait to be drafted he was like i was going to get drafted everybody was going to get drafted it was not it, there was nothing heroic he would say any you know about it it's what everybody did and that's really what the it's essentially what your book is about and uh, and there was this national sentiment no no of course i'm gonna go i'm 18 we're all gonna go right Nobody's getting out of it. Nobody's avoiding it. Jimmy Stewart's not avoiding it. Nobody's avoiding it. I got it. I'm sure there were exceptions, but there was this 
rare sense in Hollywood and around the country that you had to do your part. Um, and, you know, I mean, my, my uh, a grandfather who, you know, had a brief bit of influence back for a time, he was the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood. Um, you know, he was not going to make any effort to keep his two sons. My uncle Don went as well out of the war. We got the picture of my father here uh, uh, serving. Uh, he's my father's on the right. I think they can see that 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 photo. Uh, that's either in France or Germany. He wasn't sure with uh, Dan Murphy, his best friend from the war. Um, and, you know, you just you you did your part. There was this immediate sense of sacrifice uh, and you didn't question it. It was just it was clear and obvious. That's what you did, um, you know, uh, and, you know, and I'm sure as you you. I regret that I don't regret that we're not at war. I don't want that. But this uh, this sense of unity that must have been that must have been enormously comforting uh, to people uh, that we were all and nobody looks cooler smoking a cigarette right there than uh, uh, than my father <laughs> in uniform. Um, yeah. Uh, um, uh, this sense of unity that we're all in this together. That's uh, you know obviously we do not have that now, and uh, 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 that is the one enviable thing about the war uh that's a picture of my dad and uh and uh and orson wells uh, my grandfather excuse me and orson wells uh when they were speaking to each other uh <laughs> during uh, uh that would have been that would have been before the release of uh of uh of citizen kane i will give my uh, uncle don uh don mankowitz uh uh some credit my father's uh, older brother my, my grandfather herman who wrote citizen kane uh, uh he died uh on march 5th 1953 and uh that's the same day that uh, another very relevant figure from World War II, uh, Joseph Stalin, died. Um, and uh, uh, when news that Stalin had also died that day, my Uncle Don said to my father, well, at least we split the doubleheader, <laughs> which I thought was a, was a very clever, nice line. Um, that's whip. That's that's. Brilliant. I love that. I love uh, that. Let me ask one question that we have from the audience, because I think it's really interesting, is our final question. And I think I know the answer, but I actually have no no idea. Um, the question is, once the U.S. entered the war, were there any movies which opposed the war effort? Isn't that interesting? You yeah. know, World War II did not inspire a peace movement the way that other conflicts have. I think just because the, the, the battle lines were so clearly drawn. The good guys and the bad guys were so easily identifiable. And... You know, I I did not want to write a hagiography in writing this book. I, I do call out um, actions from the Allied forces and and even things yeah. that Hollywood were involved in that were not great. Um, there's no question about it. You know, the, the Allied side was not perfect, far from it. But compared to the other side, it was so stark, the difference, that there really wasn't a peace movement, which is so remarkable. Now, as soon as the war is over, you can see how that started to shift, like almost immediately. So we were just talking about Orson Welles. Uh, you know, the summer, uh, the year after the war, in 1946, they're going to, uh, the U.S. is going to detonate another atomic bomb as a test at Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. And they put Rita Hayworth's um, image on there, basically just like a glamour shot of Rita Hayworth on the atomic bomb itself and blew it up. Basically, you know, coining the idea of, uh, well, it had been around before, but it was the idea that she was a, a bombshell. This was a literal bombshell. And uh, she was aghast. She was so upset. She felt like that, you know, this was such a betrayal and that this was a real misuse of her image and everything that she stood for. And by that point, you could see, okay, the war is over. And now people are starting to think a little bit differently about armed conflict and, and, and all of this. Um, which, you know, those, those divisions have been with us ever since, but, you know, during the war itself, um, no, there are no movies coming out against fighting. There are no overtly pacifist films. I mean, there are films that, you know, wish for a world in which someday there will be peace in which there won't be Nazis, but, uh, you know, of course that is a sentiment, but to get there, you have to fight the war. That is always yeah. a sentiment. And even when you have, directors of great pacifist films like All Quiet in the Western Front with Louis Milestone or Grand Illusion with Jean Renoir, both of those directors made very pro-war films 
during the war years. And I think yeah. that's very striking to see. And I think that, uh, you know, we, uh, whatever, yeah, there was no division. There was nobody on the side of the Nazis who could get a movie made. Um, and Hollywood was completely united, the country largely completely united. And that would change, as we know, a topic for another day, another night, uh, immediately after the war when we get the blacklist uh, and the Red Scare. And then Hollywood is uh, uh, fractured in, in a way that it had never uh, seen before. But during the war, it, it held together. And, and part of that fracture can be uh, seen through the fact that we were promoting movies like Mission to Moscow because the Russians were our allies. And then the moment the war was over, God forbid you worked on that movie or showed any sentiment uh, that was uh, that 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 could be seen as uh, in favor of the Soviet Union, who, again, were our allies. So uh, but that, as we said, that's a different conversation. Christian Blavelt's book is uh, Hollywood Victory. It is excellent. It is really worth reading. It, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't read like history. It reads like a novel, uh, a novel about people you know and care about and movies you love. So, uh, Christian, great work, and this has been a pleasure to talk to you, and, and thanks to the archives for, uh, for hosting us. Uh, the pleasure has been mine, Ben, and truly thank you to the National Archives for hosting us. This has been just a wonderful experience. All right, uh, Christian, thanks very much. Everybody should buy the book. And uh, Christian, we will uh, uh, talk soon. Thanks very much. And again, uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to everybody at the National Archives. And thanks to everybody who watched, participated, and sent their questions, and we appreciate it.